Good morning and welcome to our program. My name is Gladstone C. McDowell II. We're coming to you today from Austin, Texas. We'll be discussing a variety of urologic cancers and the various uh, uh, treatment strategies. In the studio with me today, I have Dr. Christopher Logothetis, professor of medicine and the head of the medical branch of urologic oncology at the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. Thank you. We'd like to move on in our program to our next topic. We're going to discuss bladder cancer. We have a presentation from Dr. Richard Williams, who is at the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics. He'll discuss superficial bladder cancer and the uh, role of BCG in uh, uh, primary treatment of this and perhaps for relapses. Bladder cancer is the second most common urologic malignancy. It occurs in 7% in males and 2.3% in males, approximately a 3 to 1 ratio. The annual incidence is 31.5 per 100,000 in white and 16.2 per 100,000 in black males, 7.8 per 100,000 in white and 5 per 100,000 in black females. The annual deaths are 5.8 per 100,000 in white and 4.6 per 100,000 in black males, 1.7 per 100,000 in white, and 2.4 per 100,000 in black females. Over the years, the incidence has increased 20 to 30 percent, while the death rate has decreased 10 to 20 percent. When one is talking about superficial bladder cancer, we need to have some definition. In this picture, we have both the UICC and the Jewett classification. And notice that this is a section of the bladder wall. You notice that if the tumor is only involving the mucosa, it's called a stage zero or TIS tumor. Carcinoma in situ could be involving on only the superficial uh, bladder wall. If the patient has a tumor that's involving the submucosa, we call it an A tumor or a T1 tumor. And as the patient's tumor begins to invade deeper into the muscle, we call it B1 in the superficial muscle, or T2. It's the patients we're talking about today have either carcinoma in situ or tumor that only involves the mucosa or the submucosa. So we're talking about cancer in situ, TA, and T1 tumors. On this slide, you see that stage TA tumors and T1 tumors have from a 30% one-year recurrence rate to a 70% three-year recurrence rate depending on the stage. It obviously suggests that patients with very low stage tumors, the TA ones, have a low recurrence rate in terms of those that have tumor that are deeper into the bladder wall. Grade is the same. Patients that have high-grade tumors tend to recur more often than those that have low-grade tumors such that grade one tumors recur about 50% in a three-year span, grade three tumors 80% in a three-year span. What is more important is the progression rate. 
while a high percentage of these superficial low-grade tumors do recur, a lower percentage of them progress. And progression really means that the tumor either has grown to a higher stage, meaning into muscle, or a higher grade. Those patients will go on to have metastases with time. And they're the patients that we most want to look at and try to prevent metastases. As an example, the stage TA patients, that is just tumor in the mucosa, only 4% of them progress. The T1 patients, that is submucosal involvement, 30% of them progress. And if the patient has diffuse carcinoma in situ, 60 to 80% of them progress. If one looks just at grade, grade 1 patients have a 2% progression rate, whereas grade 3 patients have a 45% progression rate. If you add them together, stage and grade, as an example, the lowest stage and grade has only a 2% progression rate, whereas the highest stage and grade, T1, G3, has a 48% progression rate. Well, this means, of course, that you can determine how to treat the patients. And this is my own uh, point of view. For example, grade 1 to 2, stage 0, or TA tumors, do not need treatment unless multiple and recurrent. Now, this means that you would resect the tumor from the bladder, transurethrally, but they would not necessarily need intravesical chemotherapy. In this setting, prophylaxis, or treatment with intravesical therapy, will decrease recurrence rate of the tumor but it will not necessarily change progression. Those patients that have grade two to three stage A tumors, meaning submucosally invasive, should be treated, and I tend to use BCG. Now the intravesical chemotherapeutic agents that could be used for treatment of TCC of the bladder are thiotepa, mitomycin C, and doxorubicin. Ethoglucid is a drug not available in the United States. Thiotepa is the only drug that is approved for intravesical therapy that is a chemotherapeutic agent. On this slide, you see efficacy of therapeutic options for treatment of transitional cell carcinoma with intravesical therapy. Thiotepa, as you see, has a 29% complete remission rate. Adriamycin has a 38% CR rate, mitomycin C, 47, and BCG, slightly higher at 55% CR rate. If I were going to treat a patient with superficial transitional cell cancer, I would initially start with BCG. If BCG failed, in this particular setting, I would try mitomycin C next. In terms of treatment of CIS, or carcinoma in situ of the bladder, thiotepa, mitomycin C, and doxorubicin all have about the same efficacy rate, a 55 to 65 percent CR rate. BCG, on the other hand, has a higher rate at about 70 percent. If one were going to look at immunotherapeutic agents for tra transitional cell carcinoma, they would be the ones listed on this slide. We've already talked slightly about BCG. There will be other discussions, I'm sure, uh, today, and I won't get into this uh, particular drug. Interferons, there are three of them, alpha, beta, and gamma. Interleukin-2, tumor necrosis factor, uh, bropyramine. In conclusion, carcinoma in situ should always be treated particularly diffuse carcinoma in situ. I tend to start with BCG. There are a number of questions about BCG that I will not get into at this point. In patients who have BCG previously and have failed, there are a variety of ways to approach their treatment. One could consider the use of chemotherapeutic agents, and if I were going to choose one, I would choose mitomycin C as my second line. In terms of immunotherapy, there are several options, but interferon alpha is the only one currently available on the market. Ropyramine is still being studied. Interleukin-2 has uh, very little efficacy data for superficial uh, treatment at this point. It may, uh, after further study, be quite a useful agent, however. In the future, I would expect combinations of chemo-immuno or immuno immunotherapies to be the most efficacious therapy for bladder cancer that is superficial. There are other uh, ideas uh, coming up, genetically engineered BCG, uh, non-virulent bacteria, combination of BCG and biologic response modifiers, combinations of biologic response modifiers, and then combinations of chemo-immuno agents, all of which are currently being studied. 
there are several newer chemotherapeutic regimens, and I'd, I'd be interested to know what your individual like, experiences with these are, and whether um, you've been satisfied with them, whether there are newer protocols coming out. Well, we've been actively involved in the investigation of, of advanced prostate cancer and using multiple cytotoxic agents, and I can actually very briefly outline them in the sense that there are regimens that, that do result in relatively frequent suppression of the PSA, and there are ongoing randomized trials to search at these chronic cytotoxic regimens incorporating estromustine with venblastin or VP16, uh, and these will demonstrate activity that looks like to be a little encouraging in rates of suppression of the PSA. The drugs that seem to offer some form of palliation for patients with osseous metastases that have pain are adriamycin and mitomycin C that have some modest level of antitumoral activity. But if one synthesizes the whole data, there's no evidence of antitumoral activity that prolongs survival. There's evidence that select patients can have relief of their pain, and then we can not infrequently suppress the PSA, encouraging us enough that, again, like renal cell carcinoma, we're on to something that helps patients a little bit um, and, and may turn out to be therapy later, but is unproven at present to be a therapeutic benefit, but I think a palliative benefit in select patients who can tolerate it. Ron, I don't know if that's how you... Yeah, I, I think I, I agree with that entirely. Uh, I personally don't treat patients with uh, chemotherapy who have prostate cancer in a, on a routine basis. Uh, we'll do it certainly in the setting of an investigational trial, looking at new drugs. And the, uh, the combination that uh, Dr. Logothetis mentioned of vinblastin and estromustine is an interesting combination and uh, has been uh, reported to produce decreases in PSAs in well over half the patients in whom it's given to. And it's a relatively non-toxic regimen. But the issue for me has been what, what does that mean exactly? How does that, does that translate into any benefit for the patient? Uh, it's hard to measure these responses in this uh, group of patients, although PSA may indeed be a, be a good determinant. So uh, I think the answer to your question is, is chemotherapy in the routine patient with metastatic prostate cancer uh, is of uh, really minimal Limited benefit, benefit in, in the routine fashion and the routine treatment of this disease. Ron, thank you very much. I'd like to thank our viewers. Uh, for uh, staying with us for urologic updates on urologic cancers. Uh, we will see you at our next session. Thank you very much.